Hello and welcome to the Web3 Room. I'm so happy that you guys are endeavoring across the AR, VR, XR ecosystems to meet us in Web3 today. Okay, okay, okay. I am joined, my name is Sasha Wallinger. I'll be looking after this room today. I'm so excited to be here. I've just taken the train from beautiful Northern California to Northern California. Um, you'll get to know me a little bit better this afternoon and during the various talks, but now I'm really excited to introduce this esteemed panel moderated by Robin White Owen, and um, I'll let them go ahead and take it away. Uh, great. Uh, <laughs> So uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Robin White-Owen, and our panelists here, Paige Danzinger from Better World Museum, Lisa Lakshina from L3A UX Studio, and Jordan Topoleski from Archive. Uh, we're going to be talking about, as you can tell, uh, how Web3 and XR technologies can help museums do well and do good. Uh, to get us started, I'm going to provide some context for the conversation, and then each of our panelists will introduce their themselves and their projects, their museum projects, briefly. And then um, we're going to ask each other a series of questions to really try and get at um, how, uh, how, this, how these technologies can help museums thrive, serve humanity, both in the physical world and the virtual world. And then we'll have like 10 minutes for questions to take your questions and comments. So why museums? Because um, Web3 and XR are causing a paradigm shift that affects everything we do, right? From communicating to working, living, um, playing, socializing. But um, we're all so focused on the tech that sometimes it's easy to lose sight of the ideas that power all of the things that we do. Um, basically, our knowledge and our understanding of history and art and literature and philosophy. And museums are the only places that we can go to see with our own eyes and uh, be near real objects, uh, powerful examples that express these ideas that represent the dreams and values of humans from every culture that have been expressed and often shared but they're also safe places where the, the cultural differences that we, um, that we all experience uh, can be acknowledged without necessarily being threatened. And that's a really, really important point, I think, at this time in our, our, our history, right? <laughs> um, there's a quote that uh, was in one of Maureen Dowd from the New York Times' columns last week that I just want to read in support of this. Um, there's no time in our history in which the humanities philosophy, ethics, and art are more urgently necessary than in this time of technology's triumph. Because we need to be able to think in non-technological terms if we're going to figure out how the good and evil in all of the technology innovations um, will play out. Are we going to trust the engineers and capitalists to tell us what's right and wrong? Not entirely, right? So another reason is that uh, according to a website called Know Your Own Bone, um, almost 75% of Americans agree that museums and other exhibit-based cultural organizations are trustworthy. And nearly three quarters of Americans believe that museums should, su should suggest behaviors uh, to support their missions. And so, why shouldn't museums be places where the public can go to be introduced to new technologies? to learn how they can use them as creative tools and not just for gaming and entertainment. And finally, as media theorist and philosopher Marshall McLuhan said in an interview talking about television in the 1960s and its impact on people, when you put a new medium into play in a given population, all their sensory life shifts a bit, sometimes shifts a lot. They, this changes their outlook, their attitudes, changes their feelings about studies, about school, about politics. So museums certainly need to learn how to use this new medium uh, in order to speak to new audiences and to people with new perspectives. This is definitely the right moment to be talking about how Web3 and XR can be used to make life in the real world better. And museums have an important and unique role to play in doing this. So, Paige, would you like to give us a brief description of Better World Museum to start us off? Oh, Robin, thank you so much. Oh, wait, let me um, get to the next slide here, sorry. <laughs> uh, there we go. Uh, 
My name is Paige Danzinger. I am the founding director of Better World Museum, Horizon Art Museum, and a social group called Women in Horizon. There's a Hebrew term called tikkum olam, and it means to repair the world. Better World Museum focuses on creating a more equitable space for people. It started as a brick and mortar, real physical museum in downtown Minneapolis for over five years with an indoor edible tech IoT garden. And then our signature project, the VR garden, which included over 4,000 people in a space of time to learn how to draw in a virtual reality garden. Uh, we closed the museum um, pre-pandemic and started to shift our focus 100% in virtual reality at first uh, during the first part of COVID really focusing in rec room, building team development uh, leadership roles. And then we um, shared that we were also part of a Horizon, Facebook her Meta Horizons, um, metaverse horizon worlds, where I've been a pre-alpha creator since 2018, 2019. And in that time, Better World Museum has transitioned from this physical indoor edible garden space into a museum that's really more focused on uh, what Nina Simon talks about as a museum that's of, by, for the people. And in, in this current iteration, Better World Museum is a white wall template museum in which artists and residents are invited to upload this template museum, uh, becoming their own space and make, dismantling those walls and making their vision of a better world. This, I'll, I'd like to share in the last remaining minutes about our first three artists in residence and the, what happens when a museum really becomes of, by, for all of the members of a community and the agency that's found and the, the empowerment opportunities that these creators have, have gone on to experience. Angel artist, uh, uh, mother and educator based at, in New York, uh, discovered Horizon Worlds. She started building and I invited her to be our first artist in residence. She created a world focused on black art and black empowerment, uh, really focusing on her poetry and work as a mother telling her stories as well as stories of art, his, art history and black artists within it. And this world that Angel created really became her space and her story. She was able to sell uh, 3D assets as objects and create NFTs and start finding uh, new revenue streams. Today, she has gone on to uh, build uh, a project with MasterCard and has been recognized by Mark Zuckerberg for her Better World Museum. And all of these, these ways made an opening into what her career and the, the kinds of worlds that she builds now that represent what she deserves and, and wants in her life. Franz Keller created a world based on exploring pathways of neurodiversity. And today, uh, Franz K is uh, an exhibiting artist all up and down uh, the coasts and showing his work and really uh, sharing this uh, idea that neurodiversity is a way, a pathway for sharing his story and art in itself. And Shea Arts is, has, was, just created a museum about positive affirmations about her journey as a, a mother uh, in Tennessee and the local and global ideas she has. And in this image, you see a vignette where she created a, a future world 
And as you traverse through the world, you, you see different vignettes of, of affirmations brought into physical form. She's really um, accelerated and focused in her career by now focusing. Uh, she was just featured in the Next Tent uh, Virtual World Society newspaper and just uh, spoke uh, virtually in Paris. Uh, she's learning unity. So all of, all of these people have created like this whole new way of valuing themselves and their voices in virtual reality. Uh, we really took the museum to put it into the creator's hands. Great. Thank you. Lisa is next. Uh, that sounds awesome. And I want to hear more about the edible garden. Yeah, please. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so my name is Lisa. I am a co-founder of L3A Studio. We are a user experience design studio based in Brooklyn, and the majority of our work focuses on designing experiences with immersive technologies. We've done tons of projects in the museum space, and we're always learning about how emerging technology could enhance the visitor experience and really add value to it in a meaningful way. And so I'm going to be kind of holding this discussion with my panelists today through the lens of a particular project that we've done called Colors of Antiquity, which you're seeing here on screen. And I'll give you just a tiny bit of context into this. So most people, when they think about the ancient world, when they think about antiquity, they imagine white marble sculptures or statues in museums like the Metropolitan or at the Getty. They think of kind of dusty white marble um, uh, columns at the Parthenon or at different um, sites throughout the world. Our image of antiquity is entirely devoid of color, right? We think about the ancient world as monochromatic. And that's actually a problem because it's a completely inaccurate representation of what the ancient world used to look like. So many people don't know, but marble statues, particularly from Rome and from ancient Greece, they were painted, and they were painted in extremely bright, vibrant colors, colors that we do not see today when we go to museums and when we go to all of these ancient sites. So our project, Colors of Antiquity, it is a location-based AR experiences where visitors can go into a museum space like the Getty or like the MFA, they can point their phones onto an ancient statue and see what that statue looked like originally in color you know, thousands of years ago. And this is actually quite cool, or at least I think it's quite cool, <laughs> just because it, um, it really changes your perception. Um, when you start to see color on these statues, when you start to see what they looked like originally, it totally changes our understanding of ancient art of the cultures that they come from and of their meaning. So I'm really excited about this project um, and we're using augmented reality in particular as a, a vehicle for telling the story of color uh, and telling the story of art history in general. Jordan. Thank you both, the awesome introductions. Hi everyone, my name is Jordan Topoleski. Uh, I'm coming up or down, I guess, from San Francisco. So least amount of excuses for some, some bags under my eyes today. Um, I am the co-founder of a project called Archive. And Archive started roughly a year and a half ago as an online community asking this crazy question, what would it look like if the Smithsonian was curated by the internet? Um, since then, what Archive has turned into is a community of over 2,000 members in 50 countries all around the world participating in the process of curating a museum from the bottom up. The whole thesis, and honestly a thesis all of us are going to talk about quite a bit today, is one of decentralization. Yeah, Web3 buzzword from the past you know, era of a, of a bull market, whatever. But I think in practice what decentralization actually means is taking power that's been gatekept in the past and thinking about how more people can have a seat at the table, how more people can have their voices heard. In our archive, we're trying to do exactly that with the legacy institution of a museum. So the way that we actually do that is, on the first half, we pull together this huge community all around the world who participate in the process of sourcing and proposing different works to consider for acquisition into the collection. So we've held two curatorial themes so far, the first one called When Technology Was a Game Changer, the one we're focused on right now called Making the Invisible Visible, 
what we do is hold acquisition rounds where we acquire real world physical objects into the collection uh, for people to have uh, you know, as a piece of the museum. The second piece we then do is as opposed to keeping all the works stored in a private warehouse or as opposed to keeping all of the works in one centralized museum location, we actually partner as a lending institution to existing institutions all around the world. So everywhere from existing museums to hotel lobbies to cultural centers all around the world. Uh, I like to say you can almost think of it like that really popular app a few years ago, Pokemon Go. You hop off the plane in a new city in New York, in LA, in Tokyo, in London. The idea is anywhere you visit, we want to have a workplace for people to be able to see all around the world. Uh, what this actually looks like in practice is four steps of being able to be involved. Uh, the first is we actually take proposals from our membership uh, to be uh, considered for acquisition. So we do sub-themes within each of these curatorial seasons, and these sub-themes will invite the artists or the creator of the different works to actually come to our community. We host a Zoom call, and as you can see here with the artists Alora and Calzadilla, we actually invite members to ask them questions, to hear more about their works, things like that. Uh, the second piece is we decentralize the process of actually deciding what enters the collection. So as you see in the second step, uh, members can go online to our online portal or in our mobile app and actually participate in the process of voting on what gets acquired into the collection. So whatever has the most votes at the end of the acquisition season ends up getting acquired into the collection. Uh, we then, as I mentioned, work to place the work out there in the world. So in the case of Electromagnetic Field, which is a work by uh, Alora and Calzadilla, we placed it at the Calgary Central Library in Canada. Uh, you can go there over the course of the next six months and actually see it either in their main lobby or in their upstairs area. Uh, they're actually displaying it. And then members can visit this. Uh, both members and non-members can visit these works spread all around the world for people to see. Um, so essentially, the idea behind Archive is what would it look like to build the People's Museum? And we're trying to do exactly that. Uh, now I'll just tell you, thank you very much. <laughs> now I'll just tell you a little bit about what, uh, what we do at Media Combo. So um, we've been creating 3D models, virtual versions of exhibitions and historic cultural places that are like time machines taking visitors back to specific moments in history. The image on the left uh, represents a project that um, we did for the Pollock Krasner House and Study Center, which is a national historic site on, uh, in East Hampton on Long Island, uh, to create this uh, VR experience. It's fully immersive, six off. Uh, recreation of the studio where the abstract expressionist artists, Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner, uh, really made most of their iconic work. And um, the use case for this uh, from the perspective of the, the client or like why, why did they want this was because there are no, although you can go to the studio and you can go to the house where they live, there's no art there because all their paintings are in museums and galleries all around the world and they wanted a way for people to experience the studio as it was with artwork in it. And because they painted in very large gestures, Pollock on the floor and Lee Krasner on the walls, it's possible to place images of the paintings right where they were painted and people can look at them and walk around and they get to listen to the artists talking about their experiences. Um, and uh, it's, been, it's been so successful that when they started out with, I think, four, four VR headsets, they've now expanded to six and they want to create, and they want more of them because people really love the experience. And it's also, um, they decided not to make it only site-specific. So it's actually available both on the Quest uh, App Lab Store and HTC Vive um, headset store, VR store, right. But another project that we are working on right now is called the Virtual Learning Galleries, or VLG. And this is also a VR-based but AI-powered um, educational application, which is designed to teach K through 12 students. We're going to start with middle school to make it easier. Um, critical thinking, social and emotional learning skills, and uh, communication skills. And we do this by uh, leading discussions about art in virtual museum gallery settings. And it's based on a 30-year-old pedagogy that was developed at the Museum of Modern Art, which, which was designed to do just this. So we're leveraging VR and AI 
um, to power a, a sort of a, a single user application that provides an immersive, focused, personalized experience, which is not like anything you can get on Zoom, and it's really not even like anything that you can get in real life, because students can get up close to the paintings and really explore them in a way that you just will never be able to do in a museum. So um, that image of the astronauts over there on the right, that's the students in the virtual gallery setting that we've uh, built uh, as a prototype in Engage. And they're focused on looking at that, that painting uh, in, in front of them. So um, this, I think, is a, is a good example of how uniquely museum collections can be used to provide, um, to teach, to prepare students <clears throat> for jobs that they will want to have and for the problems that they want to solve. And so now we're going to open it up for questions. <laughs> All right, so our first question is, how can Web3 initiatives promote on-site experiences? Because we tend to think about these things as being only virtual, but museums really care about bringing people into their physical spaces. And um, I think, you know, Lisa, maybe you can talk a little bit about that since that's yeah, sure. the primary goal of your project. Yeah, so since our experiences are all on-site, um, I have quite a bit of insight into this. So museums are, Today, they're constantly looking for new ways to engage their audiences and to tell stories about their collections. And we found that these technologies like AR or Web 3.0 or whatever you want to call them, they really have potential to create a really large impact on visitors from the perspective of learning and from engagement. We've done a ton of user testing uh, with the projects that we've done, and we found that there's just an enormous appetite for this kind of stuff in the museum world. People are really excited to use technologies like AR in the museum space. It totally changes their understanding of the artifacts that they're looking at. I'll give you an example that I always like to give um, during one of our sessions. So we had, in one of our galleries, we had students come in. It was a student group and they were high school students. And they were, you know, typical high school students. They were kind of bored and, you know, rolling their eyes and why do I have to be here and look at all this old junk? And when we gave them this AR application, it completely changed their mindset um, and their willingness to actually engage with these artifacts. So all of a sudden, they were willing to learn something. They were excited. And we know that knowledge retention is much higher when we're actually engaged, and we're, when we're actually immersed in a topic. Robin, you and I spoke a few weeks ago, and you kind of asked me, well, why, why is this project important? Why is it relevant? And I believe that it's relevant. What I was asking about was why is it important that we know about the color that used to be on the on the, sure. on the statues, exactly. Yeah, well, why is it important that we see this color in the first place? Well, I believe that museums have a responsibility to educate their audiences, right? So they're not just the holders, or I think there's a paradigm shift that's happening. Before, museums were these authoritarian figures. They were the holders of these collections, and they have them, and they keep them, and if you want to look at them, great, but it, they felt that it wasn't their responsibility to actually teach people about them and to engage people. And I think that a shift is happening right now, and I think that the technologies that we're all working with have an immense uh, possibility and an immense, immense potential to actually change that shift so that we're actually teaching people and engaging people in new ways, and we're actually tapping into different learning styles that people have when they come into these museum spaces. And this is especially true for young people. You know, young people, they're distracted, you know, they're on their devices all the time. They no longer, it's hard for them to just sit there and listen to a museum lecture. Um, so I really think that this technology has uh, a tremendous impact or it could have tremendous impact on being an education tool and also as a driver of engagement for visitors. Yeah, and I think, you know, you spoke about archive taking this virtual structure and, and putting making, turning that into an opportunity for physical experiences, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think a big part of this question for us at Archive is saying, how can we expand what the experience of a museum actually is? So I think right now, if you go to a museum, you're actually just experiencing the very last step 
They're experiencing the step where you get to see the work and maybe hear some of the story. Some phenomenal work being done here as well to really expand what that process of actually being to engage with the work looks like. What we're asking at Archive is how do we switch behavior that traditionally has just been that of a consumer to one as a producer as well. So as opposed to asking someone, hey, what would it look like if you were the director of a museum? We're actually trying to put everyday people into that very position where they have decision-making power. So by putting them into a position where they can move higher up in the decision-making process and say it's not just about looking at works, it's not just about seeing the works, it's about critically engaging and deciding what culture means to us, what the most culturally significant pieces of our generation looks like. We're trying to expand what an on-site experience looks like. And it goes back to exactly what you're saying, engagement. We believe more people will be more engaged if we give them more opportunities to be able to contribute to the conversation instead of just having to take what's already there as a given. Yeah, and I, I think that VR works in the same way. I mean, with the Paula Krasner piece, you know, um, when people put on the headset, they, they're, in the, they're in the studio and they see the paintings and they see the paintbrushes and the turkey basters and the different tools that Pollock and Krasner use to make their paintings and it brings the, it just makes the experience, oh yeah, something really happened here, you know? And so it makes it a lot more emotional and, and memorable than looking at, you know, what the studio is now, which is not really a painting studio anymore, right? Um, so, you know, it expands the experience of history and, and because it's virtual and is available on a headset or on the web or on Discord or wherever, right? Uh, Horizon Worlds, you know, it's, um, it expands the audience for these kinds of experiences, you know, exponentially, right? So, um, let's try the next, unless there's something you want to add. Well, we can go forward. I'll add to the next. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Uh, so the next question that we were going to ask ourselves and answer is, how can Web3 technologies preserve and revitalize cultural artifacts? So, so I'll add to that. Okay. I'll, I'll talk about, um, although what I presented earlier about Better World Museums, um, people are recreating worlds that are uh, their vision of a better world. I have a second museum, Horizon Art Museum, which is a collection of over 35 worlds that are recreating art history, focusing on women art history, cultural world heritage sites and antiquities, as well as popular cultures. Well, right now, um, I'll quick share about one world, our Palmyra Syria world, where one for instance, would visit the triple arches that was destroyed by ISIS in 2015. But when you're visiting, you're visiting in third century uh, Syria at the time of Queen Zenobia. And you have the opportunity to parkour through the environment scape and find coins of Queen Zenobia. And when you parkour. do, yeah, actually parkour. Uh, and there's even, there's, uh, we love wearables, leaderboards, uh, countdowns. Um, all of our worlds have game design uh, mechanisms in it to further engage. But as you collect the coins, you hear a message from one of our Plus Community Voices members. Uh, that membership program teaches people how to do simple scripting to elevate their voice throughout the museum worlds. So as you collect the coins, you hear one member uh, remind you of your value and to uh, know your worth and all of these empowerment stories. So this is one, one example of how one world not only reclaims and rebuilds history in a site that is unavailable um, to visit because it has been destroyed, as well as recreates a sense of time and history while teaching an empowerment message about knowing your worth. And that's a, Queen Zenobia was amazing. She annexed land from Anatolia through, through uh, Egypt. And when you know your worth and share share your expanse or territory, right? When you own your terrain and can parkour over it, you're 
you're walking away with this whole new sense of not only do I, have I learned about Queen Zenobia and the site, but it's part of me. It's part of my brain, neuro, and physical experience now um, like that you're walking away with as like a steward of a site that will exist forever inside of you. Hey, hey, yes. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can make these things too with me. Um, I, I yeah. would also say that, um, you know, uh, in the same way that you're using AR to bring to life something that we can't see anymore, um, we've been using VR to, uh, to reproduce physical exhibitions uh, and to create virtual experiences of them, um, you know, 3D models, very, very digital twin-like, except for that they're static. They're not changing all the time. But, um, you know, museum experiences usually cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to produce, and they may take years to develop, and they are on display for three months or six months, and then they're gone. So if you can create a virtual uh, record of that, which is much more compelling than simply a, you know, a print catalog, then it's something that can be uh, utilized by educators, it can be utilized by museum members, it can be utilized by anybody, and it extends the life of the exhibition um, really indefinitely. So we did something like that about a climate change exhibition at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History a few years ago. And it's a model for, it becomes a model for what other kinds of exhibitions about climate change can be as well. Um, and we're going to be working on a project uh, at a courthouse, so the, which, which uh, commissioned an artist called Joyce Kozloff to decorate the interior of the courthouse. And she made these massive decorations, but it's a courthouse and no one can go in there except for the judges and the people that have to go to the courthouse. So it's a public art installation that can't be seen by the public. Um, so when we get to producing that, uh, you know, that's another great use case for VR, you know, to, 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 to make things visible that, that are not, people are not able to access. Yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. I, I love that. And I'd add to that that just the process of digitizing physical objects is really important. And, you know, we do AR, but in order to do the AR, we have to first scan these artifacts. So we have 3D models of all of these amazing ancient works. And that's important for many reasons. One is that working with many museums, I've actually learned that a lot of them don't do that, which is just kind of mind boggling to me. Like, how could you not digitize, 3D digitize your collections? Uh, but two is accessibility. Uh, mm -hmm. Kind of like what you were saying, but you know, our projects are on site, but people can experience our work off site because we have these 3D models available that they can explore in the comfort of a school or in the comfort of their own home. So I think digital preservation is absolutely vital to museum work. Yeah, and maybe a piece I'll add on to that is I think something that's so important in the preservation and storytelling of work is context. Yeah. And what these digital means are allowing museums all around the world to do is actually layer on that context, even if a work is removed from its original location. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. so there are works you know, that are inside of institutions that might be thousands of miles away from where the story itself actually unfolded. But by being able to layer on a level of context, whether it is through an entirely digital experience, whether it is trying to place a work without physical constraints in a certain location, I think all of us in our projects are aiming to say, how do we recontextualize how a work is actually considered? Mm -hmm. Yeah, most mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah, I think that's true with the virtual learning gallery project that we're working on. It's all about encouraging students um, to uh, respond to works of art with their own ideas and their own stories and not simply uh, accept what it is that curators have said for decades and decades. And this kind of empowering um, opportunity uh, adds uh, a kind of connection, personalizing element to, 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 to looking at art. Mm -hmm. yeah. It creates a, like a lifetime stewardship, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's, when, go yeah, ahead, go ahead, right. Go when when <laughs> you feel that the work not only reflects your identity, but also your values, um, that you had a choice and agency in it. So it's in order for the next generations to have this sense that um, 
that it's not only critical in their lives and as their legacies, but as their responsibility as well, yeah. right? Yeah, and I think that's where AR VR comes in in a very interesting way, is we can kind of ask the question, what would it look like to append our own stories to these things? So if we, again, have relied in the past on centralized curators, figures of authority to say, hey, this is the facts around the work, there's a whole other layer of it to which we're missing, which is, what is my experience with this work? Mm -hmm. How does this work make me feel? What do I think about it? And we're starting to be able to capture those stories in ways we've never been able to do in the past. Part of the experience that we're curating with our archive mobile app allowing those stories to actually be told and recorded over a long period of time. All of the projects we're working on in some capacity are working in that same ability, saying, how do new stories get introduced into the fold? Mm -hmm. We really like, uh, at, at Better World Museum, uh, to support your point of uh, dismantling the sense of uh, this hierarchy of traditional museums and ways of thinking and accessing that information that has been gatekept. Uh, I started as a security guard and, and ended up uh, volunteering in main storage where, in a museum where, uh, you know, 80,000 objects are below and never to be seen. And those stories have value and, and opportunity uh, for, for seeing and understanding our own selves better. When we dismantle that structural authority uh, by either deleting the walls, like a Better World Museum, right, to having um, the choice to vote on the works or to, to see the colors as they really are, we, we understand that these stories are our stories and and um, it gives it back to the people Powerful. yes yeah and I think one of the ways that um, that what all of us are doing by encouraging people to to uh, have their own reactions and responses to works of art um, is as you were saying earlier you know to make people feel like they have a kind of ownership of it right mm -hmm. and in terms of uh, using VR and AR, uh, being able to provide access to people who are not on site, who might never get to a museum, or who don't live anywhere near a museum, or who've never even thought about going to a museum and are like, what? You know, museums, forget it. Um, these kinds of projects can give them an exposure and a sense of, um, ownership might be too strong of a word, but, but a, a sense of like, oh yeah, this, this is something that I can understand. This is, this is something where I might have something to say. And so in a way, it breaks down barriers uh, for people so that when they may come to a place where there's a museum, they're like, oh yeah, I can go to that museum. And, mm -hmm. and certainly from our perspective, that was one of the motivations for us to start any, all of the projects that we've been working on because, you know, because we believe that museums really have a lot to offer people and they, need, they just need to know it, right? <laughs> We have another question here. They're all kind of. Okay, we just got a little hand warning. Uh, okay, so we're going to be speeding up. <laughs> um, so, how can Web3 educate visitors on site and off? Uh, immersive learning, virtual field trips, teaching the uses of new technology. That's part of what you've been doing, right? Teaching, teaching people how to use tech in yeah. your virtual museums. Yes, we actually, um, you know, use leveraging uh, skill sharing, how to build a world, how to uh, write your very first script. Like in Horizon Art Museum, we teach this uh, voice activating script. And it's just literally when player enters trigger, play sound, right? But it becomes like the root word of everything that you're going to build off. If you can elevate your voice, then you can also change the colors and then you can add on uh, just like you're building a, a, like a new form of your own communication. People deserve to build the worlds that they envision, right? And people deserve to have museums that, that 
are of their voice, right? So when we um, are able to add these experiences with field trips, like to Palmyra, to the Parthenon, to the sculpture park, and have these experiences where people are like powering up through them, then it's more than a passive visiting a place. It's mm. really um, like, like your souvenir, what you're taking away is more meaningful yeah. often, right? I'd love to add to that a little, a little bit yeah. into this idea of passive versus active engagement. Um, traditional means of teaching art history are off, they're struggling, right? They're struggling to get kids excited to learn. Um, they're often taught with boring museum lectures. And in, when I was at university and I was taking art history classes, the three hour, you know, giant auditorium with just slide after slide after slide after slide. I don't know if any of you experienced that, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, not very, um, it's not very rewarding or engaging way to learn about art. And I think that all of the technologies that we're talking about here and at this conference, I mean, they just offer such tremendous potential to really enrich somebody's learning experience and to really make it into an active way of engagement as opposed to just looking at passive displays. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. You can jump, you can lick the art, you can get <laughs> points, you can wear it, you can find uh, you know, treasures and bring them back and unlock a key, right? Those are things you can't do in a a physical museum. As I said, I started as a security guard and and we people always wanted to touch or or like get closer in some way to that art. Well in in Web3 and in in virtual reality and in AR, you're you're um, eradicating all of those restrictions. Some of them. Some of them. <laughs> yeah. So um, we just have a few more minutes, uh, but I wanted to just get to the next couple. We have really two more questions, and this is one, how can Web3 projects develop new types of relationships? And the other is about business models. But before we get to business models, I just wanted to step back and talk a bit about relationships, because, I, because Archive is a membership. Well, all museums, I suppose, have memberships. Archive has a, <laughs> has a membership, and I am a member. And um, so, uh, and I joined because the, the um, description of, that you gave about uh, the collective idea of suggesting work to collect and then actually deciding on how, uh, on, what, on what to collect is, um, you know, similar in some ways to a DAO, right? And I was curious to experience that because I hadn't done that before. And <clears throat> so I'm discovering that Museums in the real world have membership opportunities and people make a connection between the museum and themselves and that's what the museum is really generally focused on. But in this sort of Tao relationship, it's as much about connecting people to each other as it is about connecting them to the institution. And as a result, there have been so many opportunities for really interesting conversations. And it's kind of like the virtual learning gallery. Like you really learn a lot talking to other people and, some, and, and people that you don't know and people who don't agree with you and who have completely different ideas. But it's very stimulating. So it does, they do provide this opportunity for new kinds of relationships that just haven't really been taken advantage of before. Absolutely, and it goes back to the point you were making, Lisa, in saying, it's really about switching from passive to active. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and saying in the past, you may have just been this passive being. So <laughs> if we could change it to something active, a whole network starts to form where you see side conversations, you see direct conversations. You get to talk with everyone from the artist to somebody who's coming from a completely different point of view for you. And what you start to realize, and Robin, you've talked about this a lot with your project, is people have totally different takes of what they're experiencing. <laughs> you might be standing there looking yeah. at exactly the same experience, and there's different point of views. There's something really magical in having that conversation about what those differences are and the different perspectives that people come from. It's, it's storytelling at its most mm -hmm. raw and beautiful form. 
And, but it's important also that 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 can take place in a in a situation where people don't feel threatened by the differences because you know we get otherwise we get quite polarized. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it seems to be. How do we join your community? <laughs> <laughs> Quick plug, you can go to archive.net forward slash apply. Uh, everyone here would be phenomenal members of the community. Uh, and we'd invite you to come participate. And both of you as well, we'd love to have you. No, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I do think the other thing is, and maybe this kind of feeds in a little bit into business models, is you know, all of these Web3 and XR technologies do make access much more easily available to people, right? Um, and that's a really, I mean, that's a, that's a mission that we're, that we're all on, right? Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I think there's an iteration of this that's happening right now where if you consider this concept of a, of a DAO or a decentralized autonomous organization, what we saw as a business model in the past, I think in V1 failed. It was basically recreating exclusive private clubs of the past and saying, yeah. you come in, if you have the most capital, you have the most say, it's exclusive, it's gatekept, and the thing we're using to gatekeep is money. Mm. The version we're now shifting to and see people shift to is the piece that's actually happening through Web3 isn't uh, uh, necessarily a, a business model change. You need to have some way to be able to make your institution sustainable. What we are seeing is this question of ownership change in a new way. So can you, in regulatory compliant ways, allow people to be owners in storytelling, owners financially and actually helping put up capital to fund the way that an institution is done? All these different new forms. but the question on the other side is, how do you balance this between making something that's just a reincarnation of a heavily <laughs> capitalist system, where the more money you have, the more say you have, something that allows for more equitable decision making? Yeah. And also, you know, partnerships uh, are possible now that weren't necessarily really before. You know, like, for example, the Museum of Science in Boston uh, has partnered with Roblox to uh, build a game called Mission Mars. and. It, the, the museum had decided that one of their goals was to try and reach, um, there we go, <laughs> um, was to try and reach, I think, uh, 100,000 uh, people in, uh, or new members maybe in the space of two or three years. And when, when they uh, arranged this, when Roblox came to them and said, you know, we, we would love to, we're interested in, in education and we want to start building educational games on our platform. The museum was like, yeah, we would, we would be totally happy to do that with you. So they, they had this partnership. And I think within the first three months, they had 100,000 players right away, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's, it's very, very successful. So again, it's that access, right? That would never be possible if it weren't for these virtual technologies, right? We haven't talked at all about NFTs. I don't know if any of you want to. <laughs> it's not yeah. part of our, our thing, but it Robin, might be. Robin, I'll just step in and say, do you, do you want to take time for questions? There's oh. just 10 minutes left, so if you'd okay. like to have a couple questions, this mm -hmm. is your opportunity. Uh, well, if anybody has questions, we'd be more than happy, or comments, uh, to, to say yeah, something. Absolutely. Otherwise, we can just keep chatting away. Yes, sure. Back up to the, step oh, up to a, the microphone. Yeah, the microphone. Oh, great. We have <laughs> people who want to say stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ah, thank you. So I think what you guys are talking about is really amazing in terms of liberating the museum community, the museum, and the museum visitor. Oh, my name is Raj Deshpande, and I'm uh, founder CEO of a company called Pulseworks. We actually own and operate VR and simulator attractions across 30 plus museums in North America. We do it on a revenue share basis. We've done it for 25 years and ridden over 50 million people. And uh, we actually make money on VR. We have a monetization model, so that works. And we have the Smith, so all, any of the top museums that you know about. So one of the things we are also looking at, so it resonates very well, is how do we scale beyond the physical walls? Because there's, the world has, like there may be like we are at the USS Intrepid. There may be people in Australia who actually have grandpa landed on the Intrepid or a plane or served on it or whatever. So these pockets of interest across nine billion people, which you might actually just need 10 million of those, they're scattered across in pockets, but the digital world can reach them. Mm -hmm. And suddenly the Intrepid from having a million people a year, I'm making up a number, it's a little more uh, pre-pandemic. 
but can have now 10 million interested people mm -hmm. and grow their community. Exactly. So all of this is very valid and I'd love to explore it further with sure. you guys because the business model is important. Yeah. If you can't make it sustainable, yeah. you can't just go begging on a bowl for money. <laughs> Good point. It's not scalable. <laughs> it takes five years to even get a hundred bucks from a poor museum. Yeah. And they have to go get it from somewhere else. So you have to have a model which we came up is revenue share. Does he have a question? Thank you. But uh, yeah, so how, I, I guess I'm interested in how do we take that first step of going further to make it happen in a sustainable way? Because you guys are smart. Yeah, thank you. We, we, we yeah. can talk about that. Yeah, um, I, I think that we would each each have a lot to add to that. Yeah. Just, just as, we opened it up for for questions Robin asked about NFTs, for instance, and that I'll just kind of double weave a, a quest, an answer. So, for instance, to make a first step in making a, a, a program with a revenue strategy would could look like oh we can. Uh, sign NFTs that will um, integrate different kinds of membership opportunities. Uh, those members can also use their NFTs as a shard that might contribute to conservation. Uh, that would be another layer of sustainability. Mm -hmm. And with that uh, shard of ownership, perhaps that it could be a legacy um, piece that integrates and uh, on chain is then uh, passed down in an inheritance throughout their family. So there's there's a, a threefold way of one strategy that uh, 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 an NFT might start a sustainable cycle for a community or a group or a family. Great. Thank you. Let's get on to this. Yeah, yeah. I have a quick Thank question. You. Uh, Michael Schroeder, founder of Gallerist, generates 3D virtual galleries. One of the things that I found is that there's a real generational difference in the ease that people have in how they approach 3D virtual, either on a screen or in a headset. How do you approach from the UI design about having a, something that is engaging for a young person who has grown up on Roblox and Minecraft, but also working for somebody who this is their first VR experience or XR experience? I'm just going to throw it out there that, you know, the ones that have grown up on it, they don't care about the UX. They just start right away, right? Mm -hmm. So the UX is really designed for the people that, <laughs> that need some onboarding, you know, in a kind of gentle, <laughs> supportive way. I mean, just from a design perspective, UX design is really critical. And yeah. so any piece of work that you're going to be doing, you have to be thinking about your audience. You have to be thinking about their level of understanding of this technology especially with virtual AR is a little bit more accessible, I think, at least mobile AR, where it's not in a headset. Um, but VR is a, is a huge challenge to try to get people in and comfortable. And there are all sorts of ways to, to do that, but you have to do it with real thought and intention. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. We've all had the experience of, for years, looking at the print of a famous painting and then actually seeing it which is a totally different experience. And for me, I discovered I can actually close my eyes in front of the painting and feel the energy of the painting because something happens when the artist creates it, some part of himself goes into that. Um, so my question is, is there something about digitizing paintings that gives that same quality of feeling that a print never captures, so it really is a similar experience? And I have to say, I've been very impressed. There was a wonderful VR experience of, of Henri Rousseau, another of Seurat, um, you know, and, and I've felt very close to the paintings there, but I wonder, you know, if you could just answer that question, does digitizing solve this problem of the feeling you actually get with the painting itself? I mean, I think it, it could. <laughs> it could for some because, yeah, exactly. because uh, through digitization, you're really able to um, Recreate the tactile. Recreate the tactile. You're able to, to see embedded like layers through LIDAR. You're able to understand a, a great amount of the story about the work itself. It would be a yes and, right? So not only mm. would digitizing help, 
but also maybe creating a whole world where, where not only you expand in the layers of the painting, but you could also swim through it and, <laughs> and collect bits of, of, of the work and put them together as a puzzle. So it can be, uh, uh, not only can it help, but it can be a starting point for more. But, but to my question, do you think you, it is the same experience standing in front of La Primavera in, no. in, no. in No, it's not the same experience. experience. Okay. Yeah. 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 You know, uh, just because it's virtual, though, doesn't mean it's not real. No, no. It's right. You know. yeah. Maybe one thing I can add to this, too, is part of the thesis of what we're doing in our archive is saying that on digital forms of understanding a work, there are new types of uh, engagement you could have that you probably couldn't have in person. We still do think it is really important. So part of our model in being locationless is saying, how can we actually put works in different locations all around the world where they might be more accessible than they were in the past? But the physical experience of being up front and close to work is always, I think, going to be something special. But there's other experiences we can also unlock, like yes. being able to touch a work or feel the textile, things you could just never yeah. do in a museum setting. It's, it's not a replacement yeah. for the physical experience. Yeah. It's just different. There's one more person there. Oh. Do you want to go in the microphone so everyone yeah. can hear? Um, yeah, quickly, an answer to you, maybe put short. I'm Annabelle, co-founder of Fatopia. We'll build a metaverse for arts and culture. And this was the exact question that we've been discussing with all the museums that partnered up with us. And we have one, of, obviously, you will never come to the exact same experience because things like yeah. sensing or smelling also have an importance. But one very easy hack that we integrate into our platform is to actually scan paintings as well yeah. Yeah. to get the depth. So every museum that you visit on our platform, for instance, every painting, uh, it's strange not to look at you, sorry, uh, <laughs> is scanned. And this actually ensures some sort of depth and gets much closer to what yeah. you compare between a print and, let's say, a true artwork. So I think really we should all think about scanning or yeah. use photogrammetry for paintings as well to make the three-dimensionality accessible as well. Mm -hmm. exactly. Thank you. Yeah. And I think that VR and these digital things really let you see scale, which a print might be like a small thing yeah. in a book, but like the scale of a piece of art is something you can do virtually as well. So I just wanted to add. Yeah. Um, okay, <laughs> so my hopefully last question, because I'm sure we're probably over. Yep. Um, do you find that these experience or that Web3 is the answer for these types of experiences not to like be tied and thus die with specific hardware as we like move forward? Because uh, I feel like a lot of things that are like games for change or something cool, it's like, hey, it's available on the Quest 2 and it's only going to be on the Quest 2. <laughs> yeah. I don't think we're going to port it to Quest 3. So it's like dead, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so I think one thing we didn't bring up at all was, uh, was uh, Web XR which is certainly a solution to, at least a partial solution to that problem, right? If you make it um, device agnostic and make it accessible on, with WebXR, then it will have a much longer lifespan. But I mean, you know, I've been doing digital development and production and design for a long time, and there is definitely obsolescence, right? Yes. <laughs> Eventually things don't work on, on the devices anymore and you know